Uh, good evening, everybody. So yet again, we are back on a Wednesday evening to have our series of the ICA webinars. We've been having very interesting ones and they have been appreciated by the students. We get the feedback from them. And now we've started a very interesting module, which are going to be two modules this Wednesday and the next one. And uh, these are on thoracic anesthesia. Not everyone has experience of seeing thoracic cases being done in their hospital and during their tenure. And uh, especially to anesthetize these cases, which is a big challenge, is um, very important for the students and others to know about them. And for this um, cases that we have today, the discussions that we have, we have very, very eminent speakers who have a lot of experience. And of course, the moderators too, they are very experienced uh, as senior teachers. You know them both, Dr. Manjula Sarkar. She is the professor at the D.Y. Patil Navi Mumbil Medical College. And she was previously the head and a senior professor. She is a cardiac anesthesiologist and she was previously at the KEM Medical College Hospital, Mumbai. The other moderator, another very senior uh, consultant, and he is, we saw him earlier also in the ABG sessions. He is the professor at the Sri Chitra Institute of Medical Sciences, Trivandrum. So uh, with no, no further ado, I would like to ask Dr. Manjula to kindly start the session. But before she starts, I just want to add a few things. We've had certain additions in our webinar. Firstly, from those who are attending regularly, Last Wednesday, we started distributing e-certificate to those who are filling the feedback form. And these feedback forms are given, the link of the feedback forms is given at the end of the lectures. So wait till the end and then the link will be sent to you all. And then you all can fill it up and you shall get the e-certificate for the participation. So also, you know that we are, there's a live um, uh, webinar that, that is the presentation is shown on the live YouTube, which you can see for a future use also, as well as it is being showing on the Anesthesia TV channel, which is actually circulating to several countries and we get a feedback how many really attended. So now I would like Manjula request Dr. Manjula Sarkar to start the session. Uh, thank you, Madam, for your kind introduction. And uh, I really thank Anesthesia TV channel that uh, they have uh, really promoting our uh, webinar. And uh, it is going to be circulated at many channels uh, also. And uh, today we are uh, dealing with a second part of the thoracic uh, webinar. Uh, without delaying, I would like to say in the present era, uh, by keeping it in mind uh, that cosmesis, minimally invasive surgeries are really gaining the popularity. And today's webinar is only for the minimally invasive surgery. Uh, we have Dr. Nitin Shetty with us. We have given the difficult most uh, task to him. He is going to tell us about the anesthesia for vets, anesthesia for robotic surgeries, and anesthesia for lung transplant. He is very uh, senior consultant at Gangaram Hospital, and his areas of interest is liver transplant, thoracic anesthesia, and total intravenous anesthesia. He has written many chapters in the book of thoracic anesthesia, and he is very popular amongst the anesthesia fraternity. So I request Dr. Nitin Shetty without delaying to take the screen and please tell us about the advanced thoracic surgeries, anesthesia related problems and how we can improve. Thank you, Dr. Nitin Shetty. Thank you for the kind introduction, ma'am. Good evening, everyone. So I'm going to talk about anesthesia for uh, VATS, robotic surgery and, lung, and uh, lung transplant. Sorry, uh, can you mute those, please? Can you mute your uh, mics, please? <laughs> Shall I begin? Yeah. 
So firstly, I'll be talking about. Uh, I'll begin with the anesthesia for uh, video cystic thoracoscopic surgery, that is VATS. Now, before I begin, uh, the one thing I would like to uh, 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 tell all our uh, juniors and everyone who is listening that the basic principles of uh, uh, thoracic anesthesia, that is, which we follow for open thoracotomy with respect to uh, fluid administration, uh, uh, ventilation, and preoperative assessment, they all basic principles remain the same. They do not change. No, uh, Dr. Nitin, you can unmute, please. Yeah, yeah. I'll begin now. Yeah, please. Yeah. So uh, I'll be talking about uh, uh, three procedures: anesthesia for video-assisted thoracic surgery, robotic surgery, and for lung transplant. So the one thing which we have to remember is that the basic principles of thoracic anesthesia do not change whether you are doing VATS or robotic. So those basic principles will remain the same. That is with respect to your ventilation, with respect to your preoperative evaluation, your fluid management. Those basic principles are followed even for VATS and robotic surgery also. However, both these procedures have certain unique considerations, uh, which I'll be highlighting. Now, first of all, the indication for video-assisted thoracic surgery. The indications can be divided into diagnostic and therapeutic. The diagnostic indications are mainly uh, doing a pural biopsy, staging for lung or pural cancers, or staging for uh, or taking biopsies for media standard tumors. The therapeutic uh, consider, uh, uh, indications are uh, purectomies, uh, your uh, uh, wedge resection, segmentectomies, lobectomies, uh, decortications, media standard tumor excisions, thymectomies, esophagectomies, and uh, laparoscopic uh, uh, your VAT sympathectomies and uh, surgeries for chylothorax. These are the therapeutic uh, indications. Now, it has been clearly shown that the benefit of uh, uh, main one of the major benefits of VATs are firstly, it decreases post operative pain as being a minimal invasive surgery decreases the narcotic requirement, which results in decreased respiratory depression and decreased incidence of pulmonary atelectasis. A large number of studies have shown that in patients who are high risk for anesthesia, the, uh, uh, the incidence of complications with VATs is uh, less as compared to uh, patients undergoing open surgeries. And VATs has also shown improved outcomes in elderly patients also. Now, the surgical technique of VATS involves uh, giving two to three small incisions over the uh, chest wall. And through these incisions, ports are inserted for one port is for in, uh, in, introducing your camera, and the other two ports are used for introducing your instruments. These could be surgical uh, instruments for dissecting or for introducing your stapling devices. So these we can see uh, uh, that this is the ports for the VATS surgery which have been uh, inserted. One of the main thing in VATS surgery is the surgical uh, window for the uh, surgeon. The surgeon requires a very clear field and for that your lung uh, collapse should be uh, a very proper lung collapse should be there if the lung collapse is not proper the surgical field will be uh, for the surgeon will be hampered and the, uh, he cannot do a successful surgery so a proper lung collapse is very essential for uh, vat surgery for that quite often a lot of surgeons like to do carbon dioxide uh, insufflation but insufflation of carbon dioxide into the thoracic cavity uh, uh, leads to certain hemodynamic uh, alterations. It has been seen that uh, insufflation of carbon dioxide leads to a rise in intrathoracic pressure, which in turn causes uh, decreases the venous return, leading to a decrease in preload and the cardiac output, and can result in hemodynamic compromise if the patient is uh, uh, the preload uh, preload is not uh, adequate. And it is essential that during VAT surgery, your intrathoracic pressure should be less than 10 centimeters of water in order to minimize the hemodynamic effects. Now, going to uh, just uh, go through certain important concerns of uh, regarding anesthesia management, which are peculiar to video-assisted thoracic surgery. First of all, patient positioning. Now, mostly for all surgeries which are done through, uh, through VATS, the position is mostly a lateral position is uh, done. Now, if in lateral position, we have to remember that you all firstly, the pressure point should be adequately padded. And also, you know, the arms, uh, the quite often surgeon for uh, putting the ports and to get a good access, they tend to hyper abduct the uh, arms. And then uh, when you hyper abduct, their chances of brachial plexus injuries increase. So you have to very be careful that hyper abduction more than 90 degrees should be avoided. Also, you should be careful in positioning your head also. Too much of hyper uh, extension uh, of the head can be detrimental uh, uh, for the patient and can again cause brachial flexors injury and other nerve injuries can be there. So proper positioning of the head and placing the head on certain uh, on supports is uh, essential. 
Also, because these surgeries are long duration surgeries, uh, DVT prophylaxis uh, using your uh, uh, in, uh, your compression devices should also always be undertaken. Now, with regards to management of one lung ventilation, the principles remain the same. Uh, your target is six uh, on one lung ventilation, six ml per kg of idle body weight. The, the ventilation should be there. Your airway pressures should not increase 35 to 40 centimeters of water. And the preferred mode of ventilation is always a pressure control uh, ventilation. Now, how do you deal hypoxemia when your uh, patients are undergoing video assisted thoracic surgery? The basic principles again remain the same. If the patient develops in preoperative hypoxemia, the first thing is you have to check the position of your double lumen tube, whether it is adequately placed or not. If you confirm that the DLT is adequately placed, then you go to the other steps, such as initiating an artificial recruitment maneuver. Or uh, if that also does not suffice, you may apply uh, the PEEP to the ventilated uh, lung and the CPAP to the operative lung. Now, application of CPAP to the operative lung is one of the common maneuvers which we use for preventing intraoperative hypoxemia. But here, there's a catch. In patients undergoing VAT surgery, if you apply CPAP to the operative lung, it can obstruct the surgical field and the surgeon may not be comfortable while operating. So the best option is you apply PEEP to the ventilated lung, you do an artificial recruitment manuals on one lung ventilation to the ventilated lung. If that also not suffice, what you can do is a bronchoscopic guided insufflation of the selected lung segments in the non-dependent lung, which are remote to the surgical side. You can introduce your bronchoscope you can, uh, uh, the bronchoscope can reach those lung segments which are not involved in the operative side, and you can insufflate oxygen through that. So, a selective uh, bronchoscopic guided insufflation of oxygen can be done. Now, during the VAT surgery, as I said, that improving lung collapse is very essential. So, what maneuvers which we can do to improve the lung collapse? Prior to in, in, uh, starting one lung ventilation, you can basically denitrogenate the operative lung by ventilating at a FiO2 of one for three to five minutes prior to OLV. Other uh, techniques which can be involved is that you avoid entrainment of air through the uh, non-ventilated lung. Now you have the DLT port uh, of the non-ventilated lung. So try to keep the port closed because uh, what happens if the port is open when the uh, during the inspiratory uh, phase, the air is uh, around 130 ml of air per breath goes to the uh, port of the non-ventilated uh, 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 the DLT or the non-ventilated lung, and that can cause uh, insufflation of the non-ventilated lung. So you can should idly close the port at the at that time. If that also does not suffice, application of suction uh, of minus 20 centimeter water to the lumen of the DLT, which is going to the non-ventilated lung, can also help. Now, quite often during the course of surgery, uh, the patient, the surgeon may ask you to verify the uh, bronchial potency, especially when they are doing the uh, uh, lobectomies or they are doing the segmentectomies. The surgeon, before application of his uh, staplers, wants to be sure that he has not taken the normal lung tissue. Now, so what he'll do is he'll apply the stapler. Uh, he'll ask you either two things. He'll either ask you to take the patient on two lung and inflate the lung, and he'll see whether the normal lung tissue is inflating or the or is, uh, is inflating or not, or, or it's not. Or the, he may ask you to insert the bronchoscope, and before he applies the stapler, he'll just confirm whether you have whether he has clamped the right uh, lobe uh, lung lobe. Here you can see this is the left side, uh, this is the left middle, and this is the left lower lobe. And the surgeon is doing the left lower lobectomy. Now here he has applied the stapler, he has not fired it. And through the bronchoscope, the anesthetist can confirm whether he has, uh, 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 the stapler is applied to the diseased uh, part of the lung or not. The another important thing is hemodynamic maintenance. In VAT surgery, always have a large bore IV access because at any time during the course of surgery, they can be intraoperative bleeding at the time of surgery. They can be, uh, you know, injury. There have been instances where they can be injury to the pulmonary artery, injury to the pulmonary vein. And emergency, they may have to open up the patient. Your open che uh, chest set should be kept ready. You should have a, line, uh, a large bore IV access in both the, uh, in both the hands so that uh, adequate control of hemodynamics can be done in, in uh, event of an intraoperative hemorrhagic event. Last but not the least, the pain management. Now, the pain management, obviously, the, when the patients undergo bad surgery, the incidence of pain is less as that compared to an open surgery. But still, uh, uh, the, uh, the pain can be managed using uh, either your intercostal nerve blocks, your serratus anterior block, and with the uh, advent of ultrasound, these two nerve blocks, the serratus anterior plane block and the erector uh, spinae plane blocks have become quite uh, popular. Basically, the erector spinae plane block is just you know, an extension of your paravertebral blocks, and it does give good pain relief in bad surgery and uh, 
no it's an upcoming topic for more research but most of the times what we have seen in patient endowment vat surgeries the pain can be managed with the local infiltration of the port side and using your commonly used oral uh, non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs and in some cases an iv pca pump may be needed but certain patients uh, you know some patients uh, like see uh, advanced copd patient who are undergoing the uh, vats bolectomies these patients require good pain relief and in or in patient with co severe copd so these are select few patient where we may uh, prefer to insert a thoracic epidural uh, uh, catheter for providing post operative pain relief so to summarize vats has been shown to decrease post operative complications as compared to open thoracotomy uh, there are limited options to treat hypoxemia during uh, vat surgery and uh, and uh, uh, so big as cpap interferes with the surgical exposure so bronchoscopic insufflation of oxygen can be an option uh, priority should be for rapid and complete lung collapse prior to the start of surgery and it this surgery is associated with decreased post operative analgesic required now next i'll uh, come to the robotic uh, thoracic surgery just going to the salient features of robotic thoracic surgery so what is basically uh, uh, the most commonly the robotic uh, uh, console uh, the robotic uh, system which is used is the davinci robotic surgical system which has been i think used over many centers in our country now this has basically three main components there is the uh, uh, this is a uh, console in which the surgeon sits and uh, uh, operates and he looks at the view this is the patient cart which has the robotic uh, arms and this patient cart is docked to the patient and this is basically a viewing uh, uh, tower in which the assistant can view what the surgeon is doing so the advantage of robotic surgery is that it it uh, basically provides a three dimensional view of the surgical field and the robotic arms are basically allows seven uh, ranges of uh, seven uh, directions of movements can be done which is more than what a human arm can do and also allows two ranges of axial rotation now this is a typical uh, operation room setup for a robotic uh, surgery now you can see that the patient cart is docked over the patient and the main thing in robotic surgery is that the access of the anesthesiologist from the patient is hampered the anesthesiologist does not have direct access to the patient during a robotic surgery and uh, uh, this is one of the and uh, so what are the advantages of robotic surgery before we go into the anesthesia uh, the advantage of robotic surgery is it is associated with a short hospital length of stay it has been shown to show decrease uh, pain decrease requirement for uh, transfusion and with minimal scarring and a faster recovery however it has certain disadvantages also because this surgery has an uh, increased uh, learning curve so initially there may be increased surgical times and uh, you may require uh, a large number of operating room increased number of operating room person for positioning of the patient for docking of the robot so initially that may be requirement there are chances that in spite of using your uh, uh, on the robotic instruments and all an inherent uh, uh, conversion to an open procedure may be required and obviously there are the cost involved because the robotic system is expensive its instruments and disposables are expensive the commonly performed procedures using a robotic uh, surgery are thymectomies mediastinal uh, mass excisions uh, diaphragmatic repairs like nessens fundoplastic applications uh, esophageal dissection during uh, esophagectomies and uh, pulmonary uh, lobectomies and segmentectomies are done even mediastinal mass both anterior and posterior mediastinal mass excisions are done uh, through the robotic procedure now what are the certain unique anesthesia implications which i'll be uh, uh, going through the first thing important is that as in vats you need a reliable lung collapse in this surgery and as i had shown that the uh, anesthesiologist is not in direct access with the patient so to improve uh, to so it is preferred that we use a left dlt because it provides with you a greater margin of safety because when you insert a right dlt you have to make sure that your uh, it is aligned with the upper lobe with left dlt that such not a problem so always go for a left dlt so i'll be showing you certain figures and then i'll be uh, telling you what are the anesthesia implications you'll under able to understand it better now first of all in robotic surgery is patient positioning now this is a patient which we have taken up for robotic uh, uh, thymectomy now mostly thymectomy procedures are done with the patient is kept supine and he is placed on a bean bag you can see this is the bean bag and the patient uh, below the uh, and also we put a lot of number of uh, surgical towels and drapes are put under the patient so that the adequate position is given for the patient and you can see the arms are by the side of the patient by the side of the uh, sorry the arms are by the side and uh, uh, they are also slightly abducted so in robotic surgery because both these arms will be by the side of the patient and the anesthesiologist will be having no access 
तो फर्स्ट एंड फॉरमोस्ट थिंग इज टू हैव लार्ज पोर आई वी एक्सेस इन बोथ द आर्म्स वाई बोथ द आर्म्स आई कम टू दैट रेटर all robotic surgeries because the anesthesis excess is not there mostly like thamic knees or mediastinal mass excisions always put an arterial intra arterial line for monitoring beat to beat uh, changes in your uh, blood pressure uh, confirm your position of the dlt after positioning of the patient also because sometimes the you can look at this position the head is so much uh, uh, raised the body the thorax uh, is uh, raised by putting on the bean bag and advently the tube does get uh, dislodged from its original position so always confirm the position after you have positioned the patient now another thing in robotic surgery is that you have to have long lens of your circuits long lens of your iv tubings because the patient is not under your direct access now look now this patient is now positioned near your anesthesia table now what surgeon normally do is when they start a robotic surgery first they do a vats they do a vat to have a look at the surgical field whether it's a doable or not and after they have confirmed that is doable they put the robotic ports and after putting the robotic ports because the davinci uh, the initial uh, models of the davinci surgical system you cannot move the robo- the patient uh, cart everywhere so you have to move the patient for the uh, surgery to occur. so what i mean to say is now this patient is not positioned near the anesthesia trolley now look now we have changed the position of the table now the head which was near is now positioned towards the window you can see now we have positioned the patient is not rotated 90 degree away from the axis of the anesthesia surgery that's why your large length of your anesthesia circuits large length of your iv tubing is essential and also putting an intravenous intra arterial catheter is important another is the thing important during this surgery is that during the course of the surgery they can be in adherent in injury to the large vessels uh, we have encountered a situation that there was the surgeon was doing the surgery a mediastinal tumor excision there was in between the brachiocephalus on the right side and uh, during those initial days i think i remember i put a uh, intra uh, the intravenous line on the right side only i had no excess on the left side i had two intravenous excess on the right side no, none on the left side now the surgeon told me he has injured the brachiocephalic vein then i had during the intraoperatively i had to take an excess on the left uh, side because the right brachiocephalic vein was injured and he was going to uh, uh, clamp the vein and repair it so always remember for robotic or vat surgery always have intravenous excess on both the arms and there should be a large bore excess with running fluids another practical tip which i would like to give most of us what we do when we are giving the infusion of muscle relaxant we tend to put a relaxant uh, somewhere in the mid where the uh, extension tubing is joining the normal iv tube we put the in the midway always put your relaxants towards the cannula side don't put it somewhere in midway because then it won't reach adequately so that is another point which i always uh, tell my pds that it should all be there other thing during the course of surgery you now this is a uh, surgeon he is operating on a media spinal on a thymus now thymus you know when the patient uh, surgeons do thymectomy they dissect it over all the pericardial fat is also removed so during the course of surgery they can be intraoperative mechanical arrhythmias can be there and in patients who are comp- who have cardiac compromise or patient the preload is not adequate you will encounter hypotension there are times you have to warn the surgeon when too much of he is dissecting near the heart and if uh, arrhythmias are occurring intraoperatively you have to monitor you have to t- that's why the insertion of the arterial line is essential also when the surgeon is operating like for media spinal tumors more often you know the phrenic nerve is running through the pericardial fat and injury to the phrenic nerve can be there and the surgeon you have to communicate with the surgeon because that is happening or not because most commonly what we see in thymectomy is done for patients with myasthenia gravis patients and if these patients have a phrenic nerve injury they will definitely have post operative respiratory compromise so if such a thing happens what normally the surgeon does is he does the application of the diaphragm if a phrenic nerve injury occurs another thing that can happen during the course of surgery especially when they are doing media spinal tumors sometimes while doing the surgery the patient the surgeon while dissecting the uh, pericardial fat and the tumor goes high up into the neck and he may compress on the trachea and your airway pressures may arise and such situation is can commonly occur with large tumors which are extending till the uh, uh, till the thoracic uh, inlet uh, thoracic inlet then that time compression of your tracheal airway can be there and you have to be vigilant that if any uh, there is rise in airway pressures or fall in the tidal volume is occurring so these are certain uh, practical things which do happen now another thing which you have to remember is 
robot de-docking protocols. It may happen that certain, uh, uh, the patient may bleed a lot and you may have to convert it to open or some uh, cardiac resuscitation may be needed. You should have your robot de-docking protocols and simulation exercises should be done beforehand. Docking should not take more than 20 to uh, 30 seconds. The time from de-docking to opening up of the patient should not take much time. And these routines should be practiced all the time. As I said, for VAT surgery, your CO2 insufflations should not increase 10 to uh, 15, uh, at least uh, 10 centimeters of water. The carbon in robotic surgery, it has been seen that the carbon dioxide insufflation changes are more when it's done in the right as compared to the left hemithorax. It causes a decrease in the venous return, decrease the mean arterial blood pressure, causes a rise in the CVP. Uh, CVP. Also, carbon dioxide insufflation may also cause a rise in the uh, uh, peak airway pressure and decreases the lung compliance. Also, one more important thing is, especially when patients, surgeons are doing media spinal surgeries, sometimes uh, they tend to open the contralateral uh, uh, lung also, and that can lead to a contralateral capnothorax. And the surgeon will tell you that I have opened the pleura of the opposite side. At that time, you may have difficulty in ventilating the, uh, uh, the, ventil uh, the lung, which is not being operated. Non-operated lung may be difficulty in ventilation. So at that time, what mostly our surgeons do is they put the uh, ports on the opposite side also, where, where the lung which is not being operated, and then they take the access from uh, uh, from that side, uh, from the opposite side also. Because many a times when they are doing thymectomy surgeries, the surgeon wants the access from the opposite uh, the uh, side which uh, the lung from the opposite uh, uh, hemithorax, which has not where the lung has not been collapsed, to see whether he is doing a clear uh, surgery or not. So uh, that thing should also be kept in mind that the surgeon may uh, put his ports on the opposite side also, and that time you may have to alter your ventilation accordingly. Because lots number of times the surgeon will ask you to give apnea for a brief duration of time so that he can uh, dissect the tumor properly. So these were certain. Uh, uh, now this is a patient being positioned for a robotic esophagectomy. For robotic or for VATS esophagectomy, the typical position of the patient is that he's kept in a slightly uh, 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 a semi uh, semi prone uh, uh, position, and uh, mostly the ports are put a bit posteriorly for uh, dissecting the esophagus. The anesthesia concerns will remain the same: large bore IV access, intraarterial monitoring. So for all robotic surgeries, that is uh, very uh, essential. To summarize, management of robotic thoracic surgical patients requires knowledge of minimal invasive surgical techniques and familiarity with the robot. Uh, Left-sided DLT should be an option for uh, one lung ventil uh, uh, ventilation. Patient positioning and prevention of complications is, uh, such as nerve or crush injuries is essential. It is important to recognize any hemodynamic effects during CO2 uh, insufflation, and there is potential for conversion to open thoracic. Last, coming to anesthesia for lung transplant. So I'll be just running through salient features of uh, lung transplant. And uh, before I begin, obviously, I must confess that I myself have not uh, witnessed any lung transplant. So whatever I'm telling you is what also I've learned from the uh, books. So the lung transplant can be either a, a lobar transplant, where you are just transplant to lobe, or, or a single lung transplant, a double lung, or a heart lung transplant. Most centers over the world do a double lung transplant. And it has been shown that the median survival rate after a double lung, after lung transplant is approximately six years. The chief indications for lung transplant are uh, patients with the, uh, severe chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and respiratory failure, patients with interstitial lung disease, bronchitis. These are the main three indications and also other indications being idiopathic pulmonary artery hypertension and uh, connective tissue disorders. The chief indi uh, indications worldwide are the major four are COPD, cystic fibrosis, interstitial lung disease, and patients with pulmonary hypertension. There are certain contraindications to lung transplant, the absolute contraindication being re recent history of malignancy, patient with bleeding diastasis, or patient having any acute medical instability like sepsis or myocardial infection, and BMI greater than 35. Relative contraindications being class one obesity, age greater than 65 years of age, patients with severe malnutrition or osteoporosis. So before coming to the management of recipient, most of the, the, for a double lung transplant or a single lung transplant, we do a, it's a cadaveric uh, donation. The cadaveric donation can be a brain dead donor or it can be a beating heart uh, donor. So your management of donor is also very essential. You should make sure that uh, your donor should be, uh, the, uh, the hemodynamic management should be such that the mean arterial pressure should be greater than 70, heart rate around 60 to 120 beats per minute with a CVP of 6 to 10. Diuretics should be used judicially so to avoid any 
fluid accumulation into the lung. You don't want an overloaded uh, lung with fluids for your uh, transplantation. Uh, Ventilate the donor lung with using pressure control ventilation with this following the same principles, tidal volume of six to eight ml per kg with the adequate PEEP and preventing any rise in PK where pressure greater than 30. Adequate toileting, bronchopulmonary toileting should be done to uh, clear any uh, secretion and also maintain normothermia, correct any electrolyte imbalances and appropriate antibiotics to be given. Now, once the lung is harvested, it is perfused with a preservative uh, solution. The most commonly used preservative solution for uh, in lung transplant is, uh, is Perfotex. This Perfotex is a low potassium uh, uh, dextran containing solution and which is uh, infused at a temperature of uh, 4 to 8 degrees centigrade. The inflow is through the pulmonary artery and the uh, outflow is through the left atrium. Now there is off late uh, some uh, uh, higher centers especially have developed a, a technique known as X5 lung perfusion. This technique is used for marginal organs, organs which are marginal and uh, which uh, you want to use these organs for transplant and for improving the quality of marginal organs, they use a technique called as X5 lung perfusion. Herein, the lung is put in a special uh, shell and uh, in that shell, you uh, basically put your uh, uh, infuse your uh, uh, preservative solution and along with that the lung is ventilated using an anesthesia uh, ventilator with the low tidal volume uh, and uh, till the time you can improve the quality of this uh, 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 graft. Now pre-operative assessment for a lung transplant recipient. In addition to the routine pre-operative assessment, it is important to know what is the underlying uh, etiology for which a lung transplant, whether it's an obstructive etiology, whether it's a restricted lung disease, or whether it's a separative pathology like uh, cystic fibrosis. Important to preoperative to know what is the patient's pulmonary artery pressure, because patients with high PA pressure, severe pulmonary artery hypertension may require the use of uh, uh, extracorporeal, uh, 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 extracorporeal uh, cardiac uh, uh, life support may be required prior to uh, uh, starting the uh, transplant itself. The VQ scan should be determined because if you are doing a double lung transplant, it is important to know which lung is the better lung and uh, which lung is the bad lung because uh, then you can know whether the lung will tolerate PA clamping uh, or not. Baseline ABGs should be uh, uh, done to know the baseline PO2, POCO2 and the pH and also echocardiography to know the, your right ventricular and left ventricular function and the need for extracorporeal cardiac uh, life support. Now, intraoperatively, Obviously, we'll be putting an arterial line, a central line, a pulmonary artery catheter. The most important monitor is a transesophageal echocardiography in patients undergoing lung transplant surgery. A TE will tell you the uh, you know, the preload status of the heart, the uh, the right ventricular function, the left ventricular functioning, and it also guides the uh, the anesthesiologist can also guide the surgeon to know whether there is any stenosis in the anastomosis, especially when we are doing the pulmonary vein anastomosis. Sometimes stenosis at the level of the pulmonary vein is there, and that the anesthesiologist can uh, tell the surgeon. Also, when the reperfusion of the graft is done, uh, embolism can occur, so that can be detected quite early if you are using a transesophageal echocardiography. The anesthesia, main anesthesia goes during a lung transplant is firstly to avoid any increase in the right ventricular preload. It is important to maintain RV perfusion by avoiding systemic hypotension and any increase in the right ventricular and diastolic pressure. Always maintain a sinus rhythm and uh, positive uh, chronotropy. RV contralatory can be augmented using uh, inotropes if and when necessary. Avoid any increase in pulmonary vascular resistance. So you have to avoid hypoxemia, hypercapnia, and acidemia. These should be avoided at all costs. Also, what happens is sometimes during the course of surgery, the patient may, uh, post induction of anesthesia, patient may develop severe hemodynamic compromise, or patient may have a, a severe increase in the pulmonary artery pressures. So you should be ready with your uh, your ECLS, like your uh, uh, your veno veno bypass or veno arterial bypass, should be ready at hand because you may re require to uh, use it at any time. Now, their anesthesia goes specific to the etiology for which the patient is being operated. In a patient with COPD, these patients uh, 
uh, may have a dynamic hyperinflation of the lung and uh, your, during ventilation they may develop auto uh, auto peep so it is important that these patients should be ventilated with a low tidal volume allowing uh, a sufficient time for uh, expiration patients with cystic fibrosis tend to have thick tenacious secretion so regular bulb pulmonary toileting may be uh, required for uh, removal of the secretions patients with interstitial lung disease may require high uh, ventilatory uh, uh, pressures so uh, and uh, in these patients uh, pressure controlled ventilation is uh, uh, needed and as i told patients with severe pulmonary hypertension may develop a severe uh, cardiovascular collapse at time of induction of anesthesia itself so your ecls uh, equipment should be at hand all the time so most commonly what seen intraoperatively is rv dysfunction so how do we manage rv dysfunction intraoperatively Firstly, surgical clamping of the pulmonary artery during uh, one lung ventilation will decrease the shunt and improve oxygenation and improve the RV dysfunction. If it does not suffice, use extracorporeal cardiac uh, life support. You can use selective pulmonary vasodilators such as inhaled nitric oxide or prostacycline to decrease PVR. Catecholamines and phosphodiesterase one inhibitors can be used to provide positive ionotropy and improve RV contractility. And of late, levosimindan has also been used. The vasoconstrictor of choice is norepinephrine. As I told you, your extracorporeal life support should be uh, ready at hand. Cardiopulmonary bypass nowadays is not routinely used for lung transplant. What is preferred is either a venovenous or a venoarterial ECMO. A venoarterial ECMO is preferred because ECMO requires less amount of hepatization and the uh, blood flows are better maintained. The cardiac compromise is less when you are using a uh, ECMO. Now, what happens at the time of organ perfusion? Now, if you are doing a double uh, uh, lung uh, transplant, what happens is when you reperfuse the organ, the, uh, the allograft should be reperfused slowly over a period of five to ten minutes. The organ which has been reperfused first, the lung which is transplanted first, you do gentle alveolar recruitment and ventilate with a limited. Uh, 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 you limit the peak airway pressures to less than thirty. Use a peep of five to ten with the FiO two of less than forty. Whereas uh, uh, the native lung is ventilated with a high FiO2, while the new allograft is reperfusively protected. So you may require a double lung uh, ventilation. You may need two ventilators because the native lung you will be ventilating with a high FiO2 till the time you uh, remove the native lung and the new graft. Whereas the uh, lung which is uh, the graft uh, which comes first should be uh, ventilated using a protective lung uh, ventilation. Now, commonly seen at the time of reperfusion is ischemia reperfusion injury. In lung transplant, the ischemia reperfusion injury uh, presents with hypoxemia, decrease in the lung uh, compliance, increase in the pulmonary hyper, uh, presence of pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary edema. In the advent of a severe cardiac compromise occurring during the time of reperfusion, ECLS again has to be present. It should be present uh, standard because severe uh, primary graft dysfunction has to be managed using extracorporeal life support. In inhaled nitric oxide can be used to improve oxygenation, but it has been shown to be of less benefit. Sorry. Post-operative analgesia, uh, uh, various techniques have been used: use of non-opioid analgesics, IV PCA pumps with low-dose IV ketamines. Even regional techniques have been used in uh, recipients, such as use of epidural and paramedical analgesia. Post-operative care. Uh, after single lung transplant, early extubation is feasible, but in patients undergoing double lung uh, transplant may require some brief period of uh, protective uh, uh, lung ventilation. The aim should be to avoid barotrauma. You should avoid increase in uh, PA pressures and peak airway pressures, uh, lung airway pressures also. If prolonged ventilation is anticipated, tracheostomy should be done. Early complications after lung transplant are primary guard dysfunction, hemorrhage, uh, surgical and asthmatic anomalies, and cardiac dysarrhythmia. Late complications include chronic rejection, renal dysfunction, and malignancy. To summarize, pre-operative assessment is paramount for planning intraoperative strategies during lung transplant. Careful anesthesia induction is essential to avoid cardiovascular collapse. TE is an invaluable intraoperative tool, and perioperative ECMO support is beneficial for uh, uh, patients. And reduction in early post-operative complications confirms a long-term survival benefit. Thank you. I thank Nitin for uh, giving us uh, such a vast, uh, you know, topics knowledge in such a short time by covering all the advanced thoracic surgeries 
anesthesia with all practical points really it's amazing that you have covered such a vast topic in such a short time uh, question answer session will be after uh, all the talks so um, i request now second speaker to share the screen she is dr shikha she is also senior consultant at gangaram hospital her special interest is also thoracic anesthesia she is also author of the book an additive book of clinical thoracic anesthesia she has many national and international publications in her credit and she is going to tell us about uh, anesthesia for advanced endobronchial procedures endobronchial procedures are also you know going to be the um, challenging task for us and we need the skilled anesthesiologist for dealing such kind of the cases so i request shikha to share the screen and please go ahead dr shikha dr shikha yes is is it available ma'am the screen yeah i can see your slide yeah so should i start yeah please start <clears throat> okay <clears throat> good evening everyone so i'll be talking about anesthesia for advanced endobronchial procedures and before we talk about the advanced endobronchial procedures let us first summarize the challenges which we face in the bronchoscopy suite your slides are not moving yeah. I, can you go to the slide show yeah thank you so, uh interventional pulmonology is a speciality which deals with minimally invasive endoscopic and percutaneous procedures for the diagnosis and treatment of both neoplastic and non neoplastic diseases of the airway lungs and the pleura uh interventional bronchoscopy can be done either for diagnostic or for therapeutic purposes it could be a transbronchial needle aspiration a transbronchial lung biopsy or endobronchial lung biopsy or a navigational bronchoscopy or autofluorescence bronchoscopy the therapeutic procedures could be for tumor debul debulking using a laser or electrocautery a cryotherapy phototherapy or brachytherapy for giving targeted therapy to the ca carcinoma cells a rigid bronchoscopy could be used for removing a foreign body and in cases of tracheal stenosis a balloon dilatation using a balloon dilatation device or even a stent placement which could be either silicon or metallic stent uh, dilatation of the tracheostomy and the newer procedures like the therapeutic bronchoscopy for emphysema and asthma using lung volume reduction surgery uh, or a special valve which is a one way valve or bronchial thermoplasty for severe asthma cases not responding to uh, the normal pharmacological treatment uh, the challenge we face in the bronchoscopy suite is that we share the airway with the pulmonologist and this is compounded by the severity of the lung pathology and other comorbidities which the patient may be presenting with so we need to be familiar with the plan procedure and need to develop an anesthetic and airway management plan for the procedure but having said this the procedure itself is a dynamic in nature in the sense that sometimes the bronchoscopist needs a change in the airway device or mechanism which we are using a fraction of inspired air uh, oxygen may have to be changed or even the ventilation mode has to be changed as we go along depending so we have to think on our feet and be prepared for plan b c etc and be prepared for everything because it can be a very dynamic procedure although we may think that it is a procedure for doing a say a tumor debulking but sometimes the tumor may get dislodged and then you have to think of something else to remove it so uh as with all surgeries pre operative assessment and optimization is half the work done and a proper pre operative assessment and optimization gives a better intra operative and post operative outcome it is evaluation is as per the asa guidelines we have to focus on procedure related individualized risk assessment and optimization 
and the laboratory testing should also be individualized and focus on the relevant testing only. Airway assessment is very essential as with all surgical procedures. Uh, we need to, uh, in airway evaluation, we need to know the symptoms of the compromise, whether there is any compression, say whether interior mediastinal mass, if the patient is lying down, does the patient uh, have dyspnea on lying down, the size of the lesion and the tumor, its extent or location, a prior treatment which may affect other organs of the body have all to be kept in mind and uh, taken note of. Basic diagnostic procedures happening in the bronchoscopy room usually do not require us and they are done under local anesthesia. Uh, very rarely, if the patient has other comorbidities, then a sedation or general anesthesia may be required. For advanced diagnostic procedures like biopsies, uh, monitored anesthesia care with, <coughs> sorry, uh, uh, TIVA uh, or general anesthesia may be required. And with advanced therapeutic procedures, we can use either a flexible or a rigid bronchoscope. General anesthesia is usually is required and a supraglottic airway device, endotracheal tube, rigid bronchoscope are all our airway equipment which we may require in these procedures. So as I've said, the basic bronchoscopic procedures are performed under minimal or moderate anesthesia, while the advanced diagnostic and therapeutic procedures require deep sedation or even general anesthesia. Pre-medication is usually not required in these patients because if we give some anticholinergics, then due to an increase in heart rate and with the patient already having a respiratory compromise, there may be an increased risk of hemodynamic changes so sedatives, etc., are only given if the patient is too anxious. Otherwise, giving of sedations can also hamper the respiratory drive of the patient. Uh, uh, Intraoperative uh, conditions, the topical anesthesia and sedation could be used in some of these procedures. GA is required in most advanced procedures and total intravenous anesthesia is a better technique and muscle relaxant is rarely required and only required if it is absolutely necessary as in placing a stent or removing of a stent. These kind of procedures would require a muscle relaxant because a moving patient can be catastrophic in these situations. Uh, the, most, the cornerstone of total intravenous anesthesia is propofol infusion, which we commonly use in our, in our center. Inhalational anesthetics, fentanyl, midazolam and fentanyl, ketamine, dexmethadone are all other adjuvants which we can use in these procedures. The advantage of TIVA is that it avoids polluting the, uh, the operating room with the inhaled anesthetics and it ensures the continuous delivery of anesthesia despite the possible ventilation leaks and it allows utilization of intermittent apnea or gent ventilation techniques as and when required. Also, since we are sharing the airway with the bronchoscopist, we are really not sure of how much of the inhaled anesthetics is reaching the patient and if we are able to achieve the MAC concentration. So, TIVA gives us a better control and ensures the depth, adequate depth of anesthesia. The choice of airway for uh, subglottic and upper tracheal uh, lesions is the supraglottic airway device in which we prefer the eye gel because it does not have a preformed shape and it is easier to pass a bronchoscope through this. For lower tracheal and bronchial lesions or defects, we can, we should, if we are planning to intubate the patient, we should use a tube as large as possible to allow room for the bronchoscope and also a simultaneous ventilation. Other equipment which we find useful in the uh, bronchoscopy suite is a swivel connector which allows uh, continuous ventilation without having to disconnect the circuit. Uh, ventilating rigid bronchoscope, uh, intermittent apnea and jet ventilation are other modalities of ventilation which become handy uh, in the bronchoscopy suite. Uh, use of muscle relaxant is really not preferred and is has very specific indications. 
although it would facilitate the insertion of an LMA or endotracheal tube, uh, it may it is absolutely necessary when we are doing a procedure under rigid bronchoscope. It improves the overall lung compliance while eliminating the chest wall component, and it provides a motionless patient, which is advantageous when unexpected movement of patients can result in grave consequences. Uh, the often neglected point in bronchoscopy surgery is fluid management. And it is wise to restrict all administered fluid to minimum because uh, many patients present with a limited lung reserve and pulmonary congestion may aggravate this condition. Uh, the patient may have a right heart failure due to a pre-existing core pulmonary and therefore we need to be very miserly on the fluid we give to the patient. Most of the procedures are carried out by administering 100% of FiO2, but it is usually necessary to maintain it at the lowest tolerable level, especially when we are using lasers as they can cause airway fire. And then we have to take the FiO2 to less than 40%. So if the patients cannot tolerate the lower levels of oxygen, then it may become necessary to defer the treatment temporarily or to ventilate at higher oxygen concentrations or use apnea or even jet ventilation techniques if feasible. Uh, there is no evidence for any real advantage for the use of steroids in bronchoscopic surgery, but airway edema is caused because of the use of flexible bronchoscope, which is taken in and out of the airway several times. A rigid bronchoscope by its very nature and robustness may cause a swelling at the vocal cords. And extensive tracheobronchial tissue trauma can be caused by pro prolonged procedures. So even if there is no real advantage, we usually prefer to give steroids in all these patients. Coming to the anesthesia technique for advanced bronchoscopic procedures, uh, the advanced pro bronchoscopic procedures are usually carried out under general anesthesia with using either a supraglottic airway device, an endotracheal tube, or using a rigid bronchoscopy with ventilation by the side of the bron rigid bronchoscope. Uh, the anesthesia is maintained <coughs> using a total intravenous anesthesia. And when we are giving a total intravenous anesthesia, we need to remember that the integrity of the IV excess is very important because our anesthesia is only through the IV line since we cannot rely on the inhaled gases. And for monitoring, this is very important because we should know that the, we should to be able to assess the depth of anesthesia or the adequacy of anesthesia. Abyss is a very important and useful monitor. Uh, coming to specific anesthesia consideration for specific procedures, for endobronchial ultrasound guided ne transbronchial needle aspiration, this is usually carried out using a flexible bronchoscope. This can be done under moderate sedation, but usually done under total intravenous anesthesia. A linear or a radial probe is used, uh, depending on from where the biopsy needs to be taken. Uh, we usually use an eye gel, and the patient is discharged home post-procedure on the same day. Uh, electromagnetic navigational bronchoscopy. This is the biopsy of the periphery of the lung distal to the bronchoscopic reach. Uh, in this, the sensor probe nav navigates the bronchial tree and the computer converts the CT scans into a 3D uh, diagram of the lung working space and it requires a specialized non-magnetic procedure bed. Uh, the airway of choice is an IGEL and the anesthesia of choice is total intravenous anesthesia. Tumor debulking is an important procedure and a very common procedure being done in the bronchoscopic suite. This can be done using a laser. Uh, short wavelength laser, uh, of the laser coagulates while the longer wa wavelength resects by evaporation. NDAG laser is commonly used. We use a flexible bronchoscope, but it can be done using a rigid bronchoscope also. There is also carbon dioxide laser, but it is very cumbersome, has a big machine, and it is used only for above carina or around the larynx, but we do not use it. The risk with this is the risk of airway fire. Uh, the FiO2 has to be less than 40%. And if you think of intubating the patient, then the, these require a specialized endotracheal tube 
which have a covering to <clears throat> which are not affected by the laser so to get the fio2 of less than 40% sometimes we use air as the gas to ventilate these patients after initial ventilation with 100% oxygen and uh, the airway of choice would again be the eye gel and the bronchial electrocautery it coagulates or the incision depends upon the ampere and the voltage the risk with this is that inter it interferes with the pacemakers or the def defibril implantable defibrillation devices which the patient may already be having uh, the airway and the, the anesthesia technique is the same eye gel flexible bronchoscope and tiva argon plasma cautery it has less depth of penetration and it is useful for superficial lesions just like uh, something like when there is a granulation tissue then uh, argon plasma cautery is used and the advantage is that it can be used near stents and it can be used for lesions which are a bit far off uh, the risk are the same like in electromagnetic interference air embolism it is again by using the flexible bronchoscope passing through the eye gel and uh, tiva uh, delayed resection techniques these are usually palliative techniques using cryotherapy which has a freezing or a thawing cycle using liquid nitrogen these days instead of nitrous oxide uh, it can be used even to take biopsies or to remove small tissue small uh, tissues areas uh, it the principle of this is that it freezes tissues which are high in oxygen so it will not act on tissues say cartilages which have uh, sorry high in water content and it will not uh, freeze tissues such as cartilages which have low water content brachytherapy and photodynamic therapy uh, using pore fibers sodium or other resection techniques but these are usually palliative techniques uh, So coming to the main cornerstone of anesthesia, vigilance and co close communication with the pulmonologist is very important. We have to make constant adjustment to optimize oxygenation and ventilation. And uh, we, we must be, be, be aware of the complications like hemorrhage, airway rupture and airway fire when using a cautery or a laser. Uh, airway hemorrhage is defined is commonly encountered and is a dreaded complication it is defined as 100 to 1000 ml of blood loss over 24 hours uh, the the problem with the patient occurs due to impairment of gas exchange and it is more life threatening than the blood loss itself therapeutic bronchoscopy has higher risk of bleeding and especially transbronchial lung biopsy because we cannot see the distal end of the tissue we are dissecting. So we could be encountering a hypervascular tumor, a metastatic tumor or even vascular abnormalities at the other end of the tumor or the granulation tissue which we are uh, attempting to resect or remove. Uh, airway hemorrhage is most likely the cause of death by asphyxiation rather than by blood loss. And the, we need to protect the non-bleeding lung uh, so that the patient, so in, for this, the patient should be placed in the bleeding side down and the airway secured with a large endotracheal tube, either in the trachea or in the bronchus, which is not bleeding, or even a, bron a bronchial blocker can be used. We do not use a double human tube routinely because then we can, due to the small lumen of the bronch, uh, double lumen tube, we cannot pass uh, the therapeutic bronchoscope through it. So double lumen tube can only be used if we are unable to control the hemorrhage and we take we plan to take up the patient for surgery. Uh, and once we have uh, blocked the bleeding side with the bronchial blocker or intubated the non-bleeding side, then we may try to control the airway hemorrhage with either a flexible or a rigid bronchoscope as may be possible but if we have intubated we can only use a flexible bronchoscope and not the rigid bronchoscope so proximal areas which can bleed may be the trachea the mainstem bronchus and proximal lobar bronchus and there may be sometimes distal bleeding which the bronchoscopes usually therapeutic bronchoscopes may not be able to reach 
The small bleedings are usually controlled with the, by using the balloon tamponade, ice, saline lavage, topical vasoconstrictors, laser, and electrocautery. Coming to another common uh, uh, situation in which we are called is a tracheal stenosis. And in these patients, the dilatation of the stenotic segment is carried out by a balloon. And this is known as a balloon bronchoplasty. It requires repeated attempts and sometimes uh, more often than not is combined with stenting. The risk is the balloon is inflated to a particular pressure and the pressure is maintained for around 45 seconds. The risks are airway rupture, especially if the airway has previously received any chemotherapy, hemorrhage, acute bronchospasm, tracheitis, and pneumomediastinum if there is injury to the trachea. Uh, airway stenting is used for airway stenosis uh, and the indications could be either malignant or benign or even the presence of airway fistulas. Malignant could be primary lung cancer, thyroid cancer, esophageal cancers, benign post-intubation, post-tracheostomy, post-lung transplant, tuberculosis, granulomatosis, and benign or malignant fistulas and in the cases of tracheomalacia. Airway stents are usually used in combination with balloon dilatation, electrocautery, argon plasma coagulation if there is a granulation tissue which is causing the stenosis. Silicone stents are commonly used because they are firm, flexible, and they can be modified by cutting apart to customize the anatomy. They have ease of placement, adjustment, and removal. They have low rate of trauma and perforation. The design of the tube is such that it prevents the tumor growth into it. It is easier to remove and is safe. Uh, metal stents, however, have a tendency of granuloma growth in the into the uh, stents, and they are usually used for malignant or palliative situations using a flexible bronchoscope. The disadvantage of silicon stent is that they, it, since it is smooth, the stent is smooth, although it has these buttons which get into the tissue, but still it, there is a higher rate of stent migration. And due to it having no holes, uh, the, it blocks the normal br bronchial wall mucociliary function. The common uh, silicon stents may be the Montgomery tube, the tubular stent, or the wire stent, which can be used for trachea and dilatation of the tracheobronchial tree if, if the, uh, the stenosis is a long one, extending into the bronchus. Uh, Self-expanding metal stent is used special, uh, usually in uh, cases which are malignant and which are not amenable to surgery. They are compacted into the introducer. Uh, general anesthesia using a flexible bronchoscope is used. Rigid bronchoscopy can also be used and it is easier to position with the rigid bronchoscope. It gives a snug fit, but it causes rapid ep epithelialization happens. It has a lower migration rate. Adjustment and removal is very difficult. So if you inflate it at a wrong place, then it would be very difficult to reposition it, and it has a very high rate of trauma. Uh, flexible bronchoscope with supraglottic airway device or large bore endotracheal tube can be used. Uh, rigid bronchoscopy using jet ventilation or ventilation through bronchoscope are the airway management techniques which we can use for stents. In presence of fistula and airway dehiscence, it is important to maintain spontaneous ventilation uh, because otherwise, if we give positive pressure ventilation, then the air may egress either into the mediastinum or into if it is a tracheoesophageal fistula into the stomach. So spontaneous ventilation is maintained using dexmetodomidine, inhalational anesthetics, and even uh, local spray as we go along. Uh, the newer the newer devices before which, uh, which are very exciting are lung volume reduction walls. These, these walls are indicated in emphysema, alveolar pleural fistula, and bronchopleural fistula. These are one-way walls. And 
this can be placed in the segmental or sub segmental bronchi they allow passive exhalation and secretion clearance and they prevent and since they are one side one way walls they prevent air to preferentially go into the uh, uh, these uh, emphysematous areas so the placement of this improves the cardiac and diaphragm function and it helps in the recruitment of the compressed alveoli general anesthesia with endotracheal tube is preferred uh, since most of these patients have uh, respiratory distress anesthesia may be in, induced in a recumbent position and ventilation setting may require a longer exhalation time uh, coming to bronchial thermoplasty this is a new technique a new uh, treatment modality which is used for asthmatic patients who do not respond to normal pharmacological treatment uh, this is carried out in two sessions uh, three weeks apart first session is uh, involving the both lower lobes and the second session is both uh, upper lobes of both the lungs it applies a radio frequency energy to the airway wall generating a temperature of 65 degree centigrade this reduces the smooth muscle mass and but avoids tissue destruction and searing and with this what happens is the capillaries the nerve endings the mucosa they all regenerate but the smooth muscle cannot regenerate and is replaced by fibrous tissue and so the narrowing of the airway due to any stimulus does not happen and thereby uh, the patient may feel have an improvement in his asthma status so to summarize the bronchoscopic surgery is evolving the anesthesiologists need to stay up to date with the new procedures as they share the airway with the pulmonologist flexibility is needed to tailor and modify old anesthesia techniques and develop new ones to meet the new needs and effective communication and teamwork is essential for successful management of these challenging cases thank you thank you shikha <clears throat> for uh, telling us about the anesthesia for endobronchial procedures the question answer will be at the end in the era of modernization life threatening chest injuries are the common and leading cause of morbidity and mortality to give anesthesia for such kind of the patients is a real challenge for all of us we know that for this topic i invite dr urvi deshai she is the youngest speaker of the day from the glamorous city of mumbai and i am sure that she is going to tell us nicely about this topic dr urvi you can share your screen hello yes hello. urvi yeah. okay okay um good evening everyone i think the first two lectures were really advanced and uh, nicely said my lecture is little basic i'm dr urvi desai associate professor from sain hospital my special interest is in difficult airway you have to go ahead with your lecture can you see my slides yes we can can i go ahead are we seeing the slides yes, yes we sign. can you can go ahead okay thank you so uh, chest trauma we know that um, there are two uh, the, uh, it's either blunt or penetrating injuries causing chest trauma blunt trauma usually uh, what we see in our institute are mainly because of road traffic accidents uh, motor vehicular accidents blast injuries and fall from height and penetrating trauma to the chest are mainly from gunshots and stabs um the interesting point is that our thorax is a uh, semi rigid and it's kind of protected it protects all our, our vital organs our heart our lungs our great vessels and um uh, the even though uh, chest trauma is uh, is responsible for 25 to 50% of mortality of all traumatic deaths 
the main uh, treatment or management is usually conservative. All it requires is an ICD insertion and oxygen therapy. Um, just uh, maybe 10% of the total blunt uh, chest trauma requires surgical intervention and 15 to 30% of the penetrating trauma requires surgical intervention. So what's, what's the uh, main thing here is that our uh, primary and secondary survey, uh, the, the time when the patient enters the emergency department, the ATLS guidelines tells us the A, B, C, D, E needs to be started immediately because that's the crux. That is what is going to save our patient. That is what is going to, uh, you know, decrease the mortality because in our primary survey and in our resuscitation of the vital functions, are we going to find out the six uh, life-threatening injuries which are there with chest trauma? They are the airway obstruction, tension pneumothorax, open pneumothorax, massive hemothorax, flail chest, and cardiac tamponade. Now, when the patient comes to our emergency department, for various reasons, he could be abundant, his airway could be obstructed because of uh, vomitus, blood, edema, and we have to take charge and take control and put it in a tube, right? So airway obstruction is one uh, thing that we need to sort out immediately. Second thing that we need to sort out and look for is tension pneumothorax. So when the patient is wheeled in the, uh, into the emergency area, uh, the entire team starts working there's somebody putting the oxygen, the vitals are being taken, the monitors are being attached. We have to immediately do an x-ray chest, do a fast as, uh, as far as possible, start the fluid, start the inotropes. And when we see that on the x-ray chest, there is a tension pneumothorax, it becomes pertinent to uh, to immediately treat that patient because it's going to lead to cardiac arrest. We need to put it in a chest tube immediately in the fifth intercostal space, just anterior to the mid axillary line. If you don't have a chest tube ready, if the surgeon is doing something else, okay, we go ahead with the needle decompression that is in the second intercostal space, the mid clavicular line. Many times a patient do come in with a large defect in the chest and they may have an open pneumothorax that is a sucking kind of a wound. Now, this also behaves like a tension pneumothorax and we need to address it immediately. We put an occlusive dressing, which is closed on three sides, but open on the other. I'm sorry. Sure, what is happening? Okay. Now, as we go ahead, as we stabilize a patient, we look into, uh, we start doing the secondary survey. In the secondary survey, when the patient is stable, we can send the patient for CT scan and look out for potential life threats. Now, what are the potential life threats? A simple pneumothorax, a simple hemothorax. Sometimes what happens, the patient's GCS is very poor and we immediately intubate the patient, but we have missed out on a simple pneumothorax, which can become a tension pneumothorax. Uh, cardiac uh, contusion, lung contusion, aortic disruptions, tracheobronchial injuries, diaphragmatic and esophageal rupture. Um, uh, uh, what we um, can understand is that the thoracic trauma is not static. It is dynamic. It's continuously uh, changing. A patient may be wheeled in, maybe having vitals which are normal, maybe having a GCS which are normal, but in two, three minutes, we may be seeing, oh my God, the patient has arrested. So there is a need for continuous assessment and reassessment. Physiologically, the in chest trauma, there is disruption of either respiration or circulation. So what happens is in the respiration, the respiratory mechanics are usually affected with the thoracic cage deformity. Uh, the, in uh, rib fractures, there is direct injury to the lung. There is uh, contusions. There's a weak mismatch. There's shunting and hypoxia. Hypoxia is the most serious consequence of chest injury, and we have to, at all times, prevent it and correct it. Another disruption which is happening in chest trauma is circulation. There's an obstructive kind of circulation happening in cardiac tamponade and in tension pneumothorax. And many times when there's direct injury to the, car, to the heart and to the vessels, there may be a hemorrhaging shock. Okay, this is my hospital. You can see there's the entry to my um, uh, gate over here. And when you enter the right is my 14-bedded ICU. 
Okay, and as we see that there is a receiving area, the patient is in the trolley, we receive here. This is my team working, trying to stabilize, sending labs, attaching monitors, oxygen, trying to do a, a perfect primary survey. So we pick up the life-threatening injuries. And then when the patient is slightly stable, or when we have decided, no, this patient can go for CT, or this patient needs to go to ICU for further management, or this patient needs to be wheeled into the um, OT directly. So in my hospital, in the last one year, we had 1,500 trauma admissions. We had chest trauma around 100. Um, the maximum number of cases were due to the road traffic accident and they were blunt chest injury and fall from height. If you see the maximum number of blunt chest injury, uh, there was a rib fractures uh, causing hemothorax, pneumothorax, and then a lesser and lesser flail chest, lung contusions, tracheal bronchial injuries, etc. Penetrating injuries were very few. It may be because of COVID effect, because in the last six months, the admissions have dropped down. And mind you, in June, July, and August, the admissions were just 50, 60, rather than um, to, um, 180 to 200 per month. Penetrating injuries are, um, it's very easy to stab somebody in the neck. It's very easy to stab somebody in the abdomen, but it's very difficult to stab someone in the, um, you know, on the chest wall. So we don't get that many anterior penetrating uh, chest injuries. Um, gunshots, uh, I must say that patients usually succumb at the scene itself. So I personally haven't seen any gunshots in the chest coming to a hospital alive. Uh, there may be gunshots to the head self-inflicted, but gunshots to the chest are rare. This study was done uh, by Stephen, uh, Stephen Heber in Germany, and it was a very large study of 22,000 patients. And what he concluded was that mortality was maximum when patients came with bilateral lung contusion, bilateral flail chest, by a major thoracic vessel injury and, um, and direct injury to the heart. Obviously, the mortality was further increasing with age, hypotension, and blood transfusion, and the drip and the chest wall injuries did not cause that much mortality. He also, if you see, when we look at the audit, it is similar to my audit in the ICU where there are maximum number of rib fractures, pneumothorax, hemothorax, and lung contusions. So as an anesthesiologist, what is our role? Our role, we play a very important role as a team member in the emergency department. Actually, we can even be the leader in the emergency department. We have a very crucial role to perform in the primary survey and resuscitation uh, following the A, B, C, D, E guidelines of the ATLS because it is that moment or that time that we can save the patient and catch the life-threatening injury and uh, go ahead with the decision of surgery or conservative management. We are extremely skilled in our airway and our role comes in, in securing the airway and ventilatory management. I think ICD insertions we can learn easily, not a big deal. We are there to optimize the patient, to stabilize and also make a decision that now is the time to take the patient in the operation theater. We are providers of anesthesia for chest injury surgery in the operation theater, pain management, and post-op care. I have one or two cases which we can discuss. This was a gentleman who came with the fall on the aluminum rod. He was working in a handloom factory. He came, if you see the ABCDE, he came with a normal GCS. He had normal vitals, but his air entry was decreased, and he was desaturating. We did an x-ray, and uh, gave, uh, it, what the x-ray showed was a, a hemothorax. Immediately, oxygen was given, chest tube inserted, 1,000 ml drain. He was resuscitated well, and he was sent to the ward. But what happened then was he came back again gasping. Uh, this was an x-ray after treatment, okay? Now he came back again gasping in two days and we saw there was, he was a whiteout shadow. He had a retained hemothorax, pneumothorax on the CT scan. He needed to be resuscitated with blood and blood products, everything, and was decided that we do a left thoracotomy under GA with clot evacuation. Um, anesthetic goes, if you see, he has a very difficult airway. We had to perform an awake fiber optic. He had deranged coagulopathy. We could not put in an epidural. We took a central venous line. He was stable patient. So we did a routine induction and he was all well post-op. Now, the intercostal nerve block was given to him and fentanyl patch. We could not extubate him because the lung had not opened well intraoperatively, but extubated after 24 hours. So massive hemothorax. When do we wheel in a patient? When it is draining, when the chest tube is draining more than 1,500 
ml ml in 24 hours or more than 200 ml per hour for uh, uh, you know for uh, about four hours that is the time we need to wheel in the patient he may be very hemodynamically unstable we have to go slow in our uh, uh, anesthesia drugs we have to give it very um, in a titrated manner and sometimes we may have to isolate the lung a lung isolation of the patient may be required immediately to prevent the contamination of the other lung which can be given either by double human bronchial blocker or best is in the emergency hour in the we hours in the morning the anesthetist who is there may or may not be trained with the DLT or bronchial work, but an endobronchial uh, tube is best um, uh, is best at that time for lung isolation. Now, uh, the massive hemothorax may be caused because of lung laceration, intercostal injury, and uh, maybe great vessel injury or cardiac chamber injury. Therefore, the patient has to be wheeled in and done a thoracotomy to check out whether any of these things are there and to control the bleeding immediately. Sometimes what happens by the time you're preparing this patient in the OT, the patient ex uh, exsanguinates right there, and he, we may witness a, a, a cardiac arrest. What do we do at that time? There then there is something called as an emergency thoracotomy. What is that? That without taking the patient in the OT right there in the emergency department, the surgeon decides to snip and cut the thorax bilaterally open. And this is usually done to control the hemorrhage, to give an internal cardiac massage, to release the pericardial tamponade, and directly cross clamp the descending thoracic aorta to stop the bleeding. Obviously, the survival rate is quite poor, maybe 5%, but if you see the Western literature, um, their survival rate is from 50 to 60 to 70%. So they are going ahead with this. The next case I want to discuss is uh, this young transgender who came in, as you can see, with um, a screwdriver driven right into the center of the heart. He was little up, his GCS was poor, his pulsations were weak, his BP was not palpable, his BP was low. Immediately in the primary survey in the emergency department, we had to start all the flu and ionotropes, but he was still, uh, you know, he was deteriorating. X-ray chest, we could not do anything else except for X-ray chest, and probably um, uh, we did a fast, and there we realized that this patient has to be wheeled into the CVTS OT immediately. Yes, um, uh, we uh, went ahead with a, uh, after giving a very small doses of anesthesia with a sternotomy, and it was done with a beating heart. You can see that screwdriver was in C2. We did not remove it. And while they were taking a purse string, that's the time it slipped out and there was gush, gush, blood, blood. Again, we had to do aggressive resuscitation to the patient, but patient was young. He survived, they gave around, there was blood loss of around 2.5 liters, blood and blood products were given. He was extubated on table and he was given uh, pain relief with fentanyl patch and wound infiltration. So penetrating cardiac injury, I would like to say that they're very fatal and uh, less than 5% reach the hospital. If you see gunshot injuries, as I mentioned, more than 80% have mortality and stab injuries, perhaps like this screwdriver and things, they do have a survival and only 20% mortality is there. Many times the penetrating cardiac injury, the weapon may not go into the heart, but it may cause a, perica a cardiac tamponade. So how do we see that? Immediately, we have to look for the Beck's classical triad of distended neck veins, hypertension and muffle sounds. Muffle sounds, I think it's a little difficult in a noisy ICU. So what do we depend? on, we depend on the echocardiography, we depend on the fast, and we depend on the x-ray chest. X-ray chest may show a globular pericardial, uh, you know, a globular cardiac shadow. Um, as little as 50 ml in the pericardium can cause a cardiac tamponade. And what do we do? The only way that this patient can survive is pericardiosynthesis, but that is again a diagnostic tap. We really need to open and do a surgical drainage for this patient. Remember that cardiac tamponade, uh, we have to keep the fluid running and we have to keep the heart rate up. So start the fluid resuscitation and start the inotropic support as soon as possible whenever you diagnose this patient and wheel the patient in for a thoracotomy and open surgical drainage. Sometimes penetrating cardiac injuries, uh, uh, as, as, as I mentioned in my case, we did not require CP bypass. So many times penetrating cardiac injuries can be done without CP bypass, but sometimes a septal uh, lacerations and pulmonary artery lacerations, we may require cardiopulmonary bypass. There's one more case scenario which I wanted to discuss because this was a backstab. Again, mind you, this was a young patient. All our young patients come out very well. Uh, what happened to this patient, if you look at the size of that weapon, it went 
right. It, uh, there, it was a backstab and it went right through the um, vertebra seven and the patient and it transacted the spinal cord and patient came with paraplegia. However, we had we did a good resuscitation in the emergency area and patient's vitals and GCS was good. We could shift him to the CT scan and what we saw was the tip of that uh, sword was just one centimeter from the heart and the, uh, the pulmonary vein. So uh, everybody was uh, like, you know, the entire team was over there, the neurosurgeons, we had called the cardiovascular uh, team also because while retrieving the weapon, there could be a chance of injury to the heart and the great vessels. Initially, it was decided to do a thoracotomy and one lung, but I think the surgeons got a little confident and they decided to put the patient in the prone position. Everything went smooth. The, the, the weapon came out nicely. There was no injury. Patient was extubated and we gave wound infiltration and fentanyl patch. And that was, I think, God's grace because I don't know what would have happened in the prone position if there would have been a damage to the heart or the great vessels. Okay, now coming to our next injury, anybody can guess what this is? Yeah, if you look at the uh, x-ray, there's a widened mediastinum. If you look at the CT scans, yeah, there's aortic dissection. So it's aortic injury. Now, aortic injury, let me tell you that... <clears throat> Uh, it's a, a injury caused by rapid deceleration, so high uh, um, vehicular collisions and, um, you know, high velocity accidents, right? But uh, um, we don't encounter that many nowadays. Why? Because we are all wearing our seat belts and we are all having our airbags when there's a collision. Half the patients die after coming to the emergency area. And um, uh, this, uh, the thing to remember is that this rapid deceleration usually happens at, uh, at, at the point distal to the uh, left subclavian artery because that's the point. Uh, the, the heart and the arterial aorta are, are, are mobile and the descending thoracic aorta is not so mobile. And that is where the sheer stress takes place and there's a tear and the injury. Now, the definitive diagnosis is CT because patient may come normal. The hematoma is contained by the media and the pleura or sometimes a patient may come with a stroke or the patient may come with unequal pulsation so we are we kind of miss this aortic injury but how do we make sure that we have a high suspicion of this injury is that when you have the first second and thri uh, third rib punch uh, uh, you know fractured then you should keep in mind that there could be a chance of the aortic injury also now what is the treatment usually you go for open repair or endolumen repair now, open repair so we know that there's going to be high chance of bleeding and um, again mortality is up to 28 percent high chance of paraplegia so the in thing right now is the endovascular um uh, you know uh, stenting and uh, endovascular luminal repair which is there i think in the next uh, lecture in detail uh, so uh, most of the times this aortic injury repair can be done without cp bypass just by doing a left thoracotomy and one lung ventilation but if the very proximal part of the aorta is involved then a cp bypass may be necessary and next important injury that we have to keep in mind that is when we are doing a secondary survey is the tracheobronchial injury, which can be caused both by blunt or penetrating. Now, uh, the uh, thing over here is the incidence of lower uh, intrathoracic tracheobronchial injury is very less. It's less than one step. Most of the time, it is the upper airways uh, uh, injury which has happened. So how do we have a suspicion that the tracheobronchial uh, injury is there? Is that these patients will have a lot of subcute emphysema. Patient may be having hemoptysis, tridentic, and hoarseness, but after, and they usually have hemo and pneumothorax. So when we put in an ICD and we notice that the leak is just too large, it's a very, very large leak, then I will suspect that, yes, this patient may be having a tracheobronchial injury or if the patient is having sternal uh, fractures or upper one, two, three, uh, one, two, three rib fractures, then yes, he must be having a tracheobronchial injury. And its diagnosis is again, not based on x-ray, it has to, it's based on CT scan. Now, the important goal in this uh, tracheobronchial injury is the, the the definitive airway sometimes may be tricky. We it may uh, the patient may require fiber optic bronchoscopy, and that is the best because as we go in, we can see the tracheal tear, and we have to put in a cuff beyond the tear. Because if our cuff is before the tear, then again we are not doing anything effective. 
okay and when uh, this patient uh, we are taking for repair under uh, anesthesia either we do it awake fiber optic or keep the patient spontaneous but the thing to remember is that these patients also require a one lung ventilation and thoracotomy approach now uh, to put in a dlt in a tracheobronchial injury is very difficult because uh, dlts are difficult to insert and they are very difficult to insert when the trachea bronchi is injured so what are the other options bronchial blocker can be used or endobronchial tube now this uh, fellow in um, snehal has given a very good case report in this article where he has also used something called as a cross field ventilation technique what he has shown over here is that the tube is first passed through with the help of fiber optic and then one lung ventilation given and the repair of the tear has started and then in in intraoperatively is withdrawn the tube slightly and surgically another tube is passed into the bronchus of the ventilating lung and the entire uh, tear uh, of the trachea bronchus is um, sutured but i think we require a lot of expertise before we go ahead with that now this is another study which was done by kumar in that he he what he uh, studied was a traumatic airway injuries can be by both blunt as well as penetrating trauma but those which are caused by the blunt trauma are having higher mortality compared to the uh, penetrating trauma now coming to our next injury that is the blunt cardiac injury um uh, many times uh, th this is usually seen again in high traffic accidents or in sports injury uh, the a certain blow to the uh, precordium uh, uh, ca causes a damage to the heart and this is cometico cordis it's uh, it causes a, a arrest rhythm a ventricular fibrillation uh, rhythm actually there is no structural damage to the heart it usually happens because there is a um, uh some uh, in a particular cardiac cycle rnt phenomena happens and the patient goes into fibrillation and we all know this guy bruce lee and we know his um, chinese uh, martial art they mark the touch of that it depends it it it's based on this principle of cometico cordis now as an anesthetist when do we suspect cardiac injury when we attach the ecg and there is arrhythmia keep in mind that this uh, patient may be having a cardiac contusion and we have to monitor him for 24 to 48 hours he may have the worst uh, spectrum he may come with cardiogenic shock he may come with free uh, wall or septal wall rupture or even in coronary artery thrombosis simulating an mi most of the time the right ventricle and the septum is involved and the trans esophageal echocardiography is the most important tool if there is a myocardial rupture then yes patient requires a cp bypass uh, for it to be repaired our next injury is diaphragmatic rupture now this can be caused both by penetrating and blunt it is very difficult to assess a diaphragmatic rupture on primary or secondary survey most of the times it is missed and many times it is picked up when we are exploring the patient for some abdominal surgery uh, like a liver lesion or spleen lesion and then we realize oh my god this patient has a diaphragmatic uh, uh, tear also so if it is missed it becomes very uh, difficult because then hernia only if the x ray is so nice as this where the entire um, you know um, we can see the entire gut and the stomach into the uh, thoracic cavity pushing everything on the right side then it is easy to uh, pick up a diaphragmatic uh, rupture the hernia if if we miss it uh, then it can get strangulated it can become ischemic or necrotic and patient may present straight away with sepsis or the patient may straight away present with regurgitation aspiration and hemodynamic compromise so how do we pick this up this is on x ray ultrasound ct laparoscopy or vats vats can be used to even repair the diaphragmatic rupture now my last injury which is the rib fracture okay this is the most common injury uh, rib fractures can be multiple it can cause flail chest where there are multiple rib fractures with uh, you know uh, 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 more than two fractures uh, uh, two fractures per rib causing complete paradoxical breathing uh the rib fractures can cause tear of the pleura and and uh, and the lung and damage the intercostal vessels so the patient can come with pneumothorax hemothorax and rib fractures actually is a big burden to the elderly patient because they are the ones where the pulmonary mechanics uh, go haywire there is total uh, lung capacity is reduced there is alter uh, there is compliance is reduced there is ventilation perfusion mismatch patient is hypoxemic most of the time the rib fractures they come with pulmonary contusions 
means pulmonary contusions cannot be picked up on day one. It is always picked up on day two or day three. There is blossoming of the contusions, which causes a uh, you know exacerbation of ARDS, and patient can come land up in ventilatory failure. Rib fractures causes a lot of pain. So again, we have to tackle that. Pain again causes a lot of retention of sputum and atelectasis and pneumonia. So. Um, when we have rib fractures with flail chest or sternal fracture or rib one and two, three fractures, then we should remember that it may be associated with internal organ damage also like the heart and the great vessels. Now, as an anesthetist, uh, rib fractures can be diagnosed, of course, on X-ray, but many times it is missed. So CT is the choice. Um, uh, we have to go ahead with a multimodal management of pain relief because that is something that is going to decrease the morbidity and mortality in this patients. So we in our, in our ICU, we start immediately with the uh, IV paracetamol, um, no, buprenorphine, and all the patients do get in an epidural, uh, but epidural, and uh, we cannot give, put in an epidural if the patient is not elderly on anticoagulants, if the patient is hypotensive, not maintaining mean arterial pressure, so what do we do for them? What the new kid on the block is the erector spinae block, which can be given bilaterally. It, has, it can be given in patients who are old and on anticoagulants. It One block can cover three, four ribs. So it's a more safer way of giving. And also an ultrasound can be used. So again, it is safe. Um, the serratus uh, uh, anterior block can also be given, but what happens in this is it only uh, gives energy say, to the anterior and not to the lateral chest wall. Uh, many of the patients uh, with rib fractures not only require oxygen through NRBM, but as the contusions uh, worsen, they may require HFNC, NIV, and sometimes mechanical ventilation. Now, can these patients be for surgery? Yes. If there is a flail chest patient and he's on mechanical ventilation, then yes, he is uh, a candidate to have his, uh, his uh, um, uh, rib fractures repaired surgically. And in this also, we need to give uh, uh, you know one lung ventilation so it can be uh, provided either with the DLT or the uh, bronchial blocker. Okay, so I'd like to uh, uh, again stress on my anesthesia concerns or the goals of cardiothoracic anesthesia and chest trauma is that one, we have to know our ATLS guidelines by heart. We have to know our airway, breathing, circulation, disability, exposure. There has to be continuous assessment and reassessment to uh, to catch the, the life-threatening injury at the correct point and save the patient and prevent the mortality. Emergency thoracotomy, yes, has to, ha is is a point to save the patient. Hemodynamic instability is always there with cardiothoracic trauma. So we remember our six life threats and our six potential life threats, which I have said. Permissive uh, arterial hypertension in a hemorrhaging patient, keeping systolic blood pressure between 80 to 100 is allowed. Of course, the patient should not be having a head injury and many other injuries. Hypothermia, uh, vasopressor infusion should be started early to reach target blood pressure. Hypothermia, coagulopathy, acidosis is always a part of the chest trauma. And we must try to avoid it by maintaining blood pressure, temperature, and tissue perfusion. Definitive surgical arrest of hemorrhage from major vessels is a priority. The patient needs to be wheeled into the theater immediately, even if he is hemodynamically unstable. Most of the uh, chest trauma surgical interventions, uh, they require left thoracotomy with one lung ventilation. There is a role of VATS in retained hemothorax, persistent pneumothorax, diaphragmatic injury, post-traumatic empyema. Anesthesia plan is formulated according to the patient and the, the injury of the patient and the surgical consideration. Yes, we should be ready with our airway skills with direct laryngoscope, VL scope or fiber optic, uh, keeping in mind rapid sequence as well as manual inline immobilization. The drug of choice of anesthesia, king, uh, etomidase is a king of all. Small dose of ketamine can be given and midas fentanyl have always been the stable drugs to give in cardiac injuries. Nitric, uh, nitrous oxide should be avoided. Low concentration inhalation agents can be used and pain relief improves outcome. These are my references. I'm very grateful to all my assistant professors who work 24 seven in trauma care and OT. Jo, uh, my Madam Jyoti, Madam, for her beautiful chapter on chest trauma in our uh, book, A Practical Approach to um, uh, Emergency Anesthesia, and my present tra trauma ICU consultant, Dr. Devendra. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Urvi, for um, telling us about uh, how the chest trauma should be managed. 
now i want all the speakers to come on the dais and uh, i request dr sunil to conduct the question answer session i i'm sure that there are few questions uh, from the audience side and even i have few questions to ask so all the panelist thank you madam uh, all three speakers uh, gave an uh, excellent talk and uh, i have a few uh, questions from the audience side uh, we have not had uh, much questions so i'll uh, open the question session uh, let's start with dr nitin uh, sethi yes sir uh, uh, dr nitin you said that um, can you uh, open your screen i can't see you dr nitin dr shikha i can see i think urvi you have to un um, unshare your screen okay okay one minute उटेड Uh, you you mentioned uh, uh, in your uh, table about lung recruitment. Yes. Uh, how do you recruit the lung? Uh, sir, one uh, lung ventilation. Yes, sir. Yeah. So ideally, I uh, ideally it, earlier it was taught that you do a manual recruitment using a bag, but now what is uh, uh, is that you have to do a lung recruitment using the ventilator. so uh, what i usually do is uh, what my uh, this is the protocol given by tunstall in one of his uh, articles uh, i modified it a bit prior to starting olv on 2lv i first start the recruitment what mine is i uh, put it put the patient on pressure controlled ventilation uh, set the target pressure at 20 your respiratory rate at 10 i ratio 1 is to 1 and with a peep of 5 so uh, pre target pressure 20 peep of uh, peep of 5 and then you increase uh, uh, in increments of 5 uh, increase the peep because the driving pressure should remain 20 at all the time target pressure 20 peep of 5 uh, 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 you ventilate uh, with i ratio 1 is to 1 you ventilate for 30 seconds then increase the peep to 10 your target pressure remain 20 uh, is still 20 so your total uh, your driving pressure becomes your plateau pressure becomes 30 the uh, peep is 10 your uh, driving pressure becomes 20 then you ventilate for another 30 seconds with 1 is to 1 setting itself uh, then after that you increase the peep by 5 more so your peep becomes 15 your uh, target pressure remains 20 so your driving pressure becomes 35 minus 15 again 20 ventilate for another 30 seconds this i am talking for a normal lung not for a patient lung with yeah. emphysema or the yeah. and in the end you increase the peep to 20 again then for 1 minute so total cycle is 2.3 minutes but at all times you have to keep in mind the hemodynamics at any time there is going to be hemodynamic compromise you have to abort this uh, artificial recruitment uh, uh, maneuver has to be aborted and also in patient is uh, suppose an emphysema patient or a copd you know in that you cannot give uh, high peaks because lung injury chances are there but more or less in many of the patients i found this artificial recruitment maneuvers to be quite very effective not only for thoracic but also for laparoscopic uh, in abdominal uh, other surgeries also and this is a, a protocol in various studies tunstall and all they have given this uh, and another is you do a cyclic recruitment maneuver in cyclic recruitment maneuver you increase the peep in steps looking at the patient compliance the point at which the compliance begins to deteriorate at that peep level then you set a peep level two less than at which you're getting a proper compliance and that becomes your peep that you should uh, give to the patient so that's how i uh, yeah, you're uh, talking about uh, dynamic compliance but uh, yes. Yes. that uh, you have to manually calculate it will not be available on the anesthesia machines but some uh, total lung compliance some uh, ventilators do uh, give your compliance values so i uh, Yeah, uh, yeah, the driver and all. They do. Yeah, endpoints for uh, adequate recruitment are not uh, exactly. It is not exactly possible to know in the OT. Yeah, if but I right usually here. go for if there's a because normally what will happen, sir, is like once you do these maneuvers, your oxygenation won't start rising immediately. Uh, once you 
increase, keep on cyclically increasing the peep. Obviously, your delivered tidal volume will fall for some time. But once you come back to your original settings, you will see Perfect. that your tidal volume deliver increases and the oxygenation started uh, starts rising uh, after a few uh, seconds. Yeah. And it's very really helpful. Yeah. The same tidal volume now gets delivered at a lower airway pressure. Yeah, that at a lower airway pressure. And Perfect. for me, it's special control ventilation is the key. That's that's what I'm doing. And at lots of times, what has happens is one more thing which I practically do is your airway pressures are rising. You are set an IE ratio of say one is to two, but there's you can go on low on the IE ratio. I tend to reduce the IE ratio so that I don't compromise on my airway pressure. Then that also gives a good uh, tidal volume uh, delivery if you are not able to achieve, especially when they are doing a capnothorax and uh, insufflating carbon dioxide. And that maneuver also, it's like you're uh, ventilating a, in, during a restrictive lung. So reducing the IE ratio also helps a lot. Uh, your preferred mode of ventilation, I understand, is pressure control. Pressure right? control, always. Is it uh, same for the other speakers? Yes, yes, even I prefer. Doctor uh, Nitin, can, uh, yeah. Can I ask something here? Yeah, sure, sure. I just want to know how much maximum peep you can give it uh, in such kind of the situations. Ma'am, for just for recruitment per se, you can go up till twenty, but that only for few uh, seconds. But also looking at the hemodynamics. After that, you come to your baseline setting of peep, so five or seven. Or if you can uh, have uh, assert, or you can look at your compliance and what is the uh, optimal peep at which you are getting good compliance. That is not uh, very uh, practically very e of easy to do all the time. So what I usually do is set a baseline. Uh, suppose I'm ventilating patient at a peep of five or seven. Firstly, I recruit using this maneuver. Then come mm -hmm. to a baseline, say five seven peep, and at which your good tidal volume is delivering. At so, so maximum to my, up to 20 can be used. Yeah, can be used, but looking into Perfect. point of hemodynamics and the patient's lung yeah, disease. Yeah. If it's By a keeping bulla and all, other... obviously, bulla's lung disease and all, you cannot go on high pace. No, so uh, that is okay. That yeah. means By keeping all the hemodynamic monitoring in our mind, mind, we can give up to 20. 20. Uh, ah, yeah. so and that... my second question is that how much should be the duration of training uh, to the newcomers those wants to learn the advanced uh, thoracic surgery anesthesia uh, according IT, to your uh, experience and your practice ma'am uh, frankly i will uh, tell you when we started uh, uh, doing high we were doing thoracic i did in my training also when i did my dnb some amount of like maybe thoracic was then but i think in since 2012 we had a team which was doing uh, uh, roughly around 100 to 120 thoracic cases a month. Mm -hmm. So uh, I typically in a year end up doing around 50 thoracic cases a month. Mm -hmm. a, a year, sorry. 50 to 60 thoracic cases uh, a year. But if you are, uh, you know, very well versed with principles of general thoracic anesthesia, it mm -hmm. won't be a problem. Obviously, so I think... Three months or six months? I'll say uh, three months is a good time period if you are exposed to a reasonable, say, 10 thoracic cases a month. Mm -hmm. So a year, a week, sorry, at least five or maybe twenty a month is you know gives a whole lot Miss, of uh, the centers like yours. Yeah, because our center is offering one of the centers offering WFSA fellowship in thoracic anesthesia. Okay. So we go, yeah, we have offered a six month uh, fellowship in that. <laughs> yeah. Doctor Sunil, you want to know something else? Yeah, uh, Doctor uh, Sethi, uh, yes, once sir. again. Yes. Sir. Uh, with regard to lung collapse for uh, yes, bad surgery, uh, yes, you mentioned how important it is, and you gave three points uh, yes, which must be uh, meticulously followed to achieve complete lung collapse. Yes, sir. But the point at which you come to know whether the lung has completely collapsed or not is when the su surgeon has inserted his uh, uh, scope. Definitely. Yes, sir. Uh, has it happened to you that at that time the lung is not adequately collapsed or not collapsed enough for that surgeon? Yes, sometimes it, yes, uh, sir, it does. What do you does, do then? Sir, it does happen. Uh, obviously, at that time, ventilating with 100% oxygen is not an option. What yeah. mostly we follow is uh, either, uh, you know, putting in a, a catheter and uh, uh, applying some uh, suction. That's what I r routinely do. And first of all is to check the positioning. Quite often, it also happens, I think, 40, 30, 40, 50% of the time, it is that your uh, cuff has moved out a bit. Your positioning of the tube has got is wrong so that may sometimes so repositioning has to be done obviously repositioning in a lateral position is a challenge in itself 
because you know your tube yeah. is all uh, you have uh, fixed the tube you have to remove the fixations but so, most of the time we get away with applying uh, suction to the non ventilated sites okay uh, just for the benefit of the uh, listeners the three steps which you should uh, follow early is ventilate with 100% oxygen before you go in for lung collapse the purpose is to achieve uh, denitrogenation denitrogenation then uh, and then uh, uh, apply a suction to the uh, operative site and as uh, dr nitin has mentioned avoid uh, 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 prevent room air from entering that uh, lumen those and are the three Yeah, for yeah. the postgraduates, a point of caution: when the suction is, please remove the suction prior to firing of the staplers. It has happened. I have. It has happened with me also. You forgot. To, so it it has to be a drill. Even a surgeon's prefer to have a drill. All catheters out at the time of firing your staplers because that you have to make sure that firing the staplers, the suction should not be inside. It will get yeah. fired in the stapler and it will be a problem. Yeah. That has to be kept in mind. you also mentioned a bronchoscopic guided uh, oxygen insufflation into the zone of uh, uh, into the into an area where the surgeon is not working yeah. how, how well does that work have so you tried don't, it don't use it that routinely use it very few um, time because that also some disturbs the surgeon because uh, mm-hmm. you are giving the oxygen the lung will start inflating at that time and the surgeon does not like it most of the time the surgeons what they prefer is they get away or surgeons prefer putting a capnothorax all the time to increase the exposure but sometimes you have to be careful the surgeons in their you know they uh, obviously they don't go beyond 10 but sometimes they may increase and uh, capnothorax then has uh, hemodynamic problems you do face with the capnothorax so that uh, procedure of uh, oxygenation using is very uh, not routinely used but sometimes you may have to use and many of the times by increasing the fio2 and all you can get away but then you have to understand like how much spo2 is acceptable for me mm-hmm. even if it is going till 90 for some time i accept but if it is going less than 90 for then you have to tell the surgeon quite often that we take the patient on two lung ventilate for some time obviously those are the last measures which you may have to resolve if nothing improves uh dr nitin again you brought up the point that uh, you may have to put you must put uh, intravenous big bore access and uh, venous lines on both upper limbs definitely uh, why not go in for a, a, a lower limb uh, venous line the question also goes to dr uh, urvi desai she deals with uh, chest trauma where uh, venous structures in the uh, chest or neck they can be avulsed injured so so you, uh, you... so most count what i have sorry i'm encountered is there is injury to the site at where they are operating very rarely mm-hmm. it has happened that both sites they may injure although i agree it has happened to be once only where they somehow they ended up injuring brachiocephalic veins on either side but mostly if you put large bore on either of the uh, both the limbs it suffices most of the time mm-hmm. majority of the time because it's very unlikely they'll uh, injure both the sides but obviously that's a good point having a one uh, axis and the lower limb also is not a bad idea but mostly you can get away by having in both the limbs upper limbs uh, dr urvi desai i saw a, a, a picture that you presented there was a intra inter, uh, internal jugular venous line uh wouldn't you prefer a lower limb line in such a situation let us say in the femoral vein you are not audible uh urvi urvi can you share your screen now urvi yeah 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 okay now can you hear me yeah. yes yeah so what happens is when the patient is wheeled in we take the best available iv line at that moment which is there and something which is large and big is a ejv i think what you saw in that picture was the extra jugular vein which was taken okay. and the patient resuscitated and when the patient was wheeled in in the ot yes we must have gone for we did take an ijv because that time we realized that the patient had a penetrating injury to the heart it was seen on the x ray that the screw driver is going inside the heart uh what you are suggesting to take femo- uh, you know lower limb femoral veins yes we can go ahead uh, especially if the great vessels are involved if 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 i know that for some reason there is a great vessel injury but that i would never know unless i do a thoracotomy and then find out uh can i say something here sure ma'am 
but uh, lower limb uh, um, veins are really not advisable in view of so many other problems and whenever uh, such kind of the patients are coming to us we always try to take the internal jugular or subclavian or external jugular even and i want to know one thing from urvi that what advanced monitoring you would like to advise in such kind of the patients advanced monitoring yeah if we have a tee in cases of uh, penetrating cardiac injuries and you're doing uh, uh, that would be a very good uh, thing trans esophageal echocardiography otherwise our normal invasive arterial line monitoring and our um, uh, will have uh, 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 many of the gold uh, uh, you know a directed uh, uh, monitoring like we could get our pulse pressure variations and we could get everything just from an invasive arch line and go ahead what about the cerebral oximetry and yes. uh, internal jugular yeah we should have uh, anesthetic depth monitoring we must have uh, wherever it's available and possible no, and so i'm not i'm not yes. talking about the depth monitoring i'm talking about the oximetry cerebral oximetry yes we should have it if it's available we should have it so you That's advise that cerebral oxygen saturation should be monitored in uh, such kind of the in uh, trauma patients yeah penetrating cardiac and great vessel injuries yes i advise okay and i want to know one thing from dr shikha that how much uh, oxygen fall is advisable from the baseline in uh, advanced endobronchial surgical patients <clears throat> how uh, much fall in oxygen saturation from the baseline is permissible for uh, advanced endobronchial surgical patients yeah usually what we are doing is we are taking fio2 of one most mm. of the procedures unless it is a laser or an argon uh, or uh, some cautery in which there is a chance of fire but as a thumb rule yes a 4% decline from the baseline could be acceptable 4% yes not 10% i usually take it as 4 to 5% okay yeah okay thank you very much any other question uh we have a, a question from audience uh, in mediastinal tumors involving svc should we consider femoral vein sheets in advance to deliver volume to the svc is injured intraoperatively that is from the audience yeah that look what happens is uh, surgeons whenever if it is large tumor involving the great vessels svc and all they prefer to do it in a, a cardiac setup with a bypass uh, uh, available standby and many a times if it is really encasing the svc and involving the larger vessels nearby then they prefer to go on a bypass and then do such uh, cases and uh, prefer and it is obviously advisable to have your uh, ecmo devices standby even if you're not planning to buy when you're doing such cases and uh, obviously look at which structures uh, then obviously uh, the lower limb access may be needed in such cases if you know bilaterally you are involving the great vessels obviously if we see in ward then giving fluids from the upper limb will be a difficult task then you have to go in for a few more cases um dr ashika sharma uh I I do not have much experience with many of the procedures you uh, presented, but I have done a few uh, cases of tracheal stenosis and tracheal stenting. But in those cases, uh, we we have always uh, used uh, local anesthesia for the airway along with tiva. So, what's your experience uh, with regard to airway airway blocks along with the uh, general anesthesia? Uh, we usually use a total intravenous anesthesia using an eye gel and a flexible bronchoscope. for stenting in our procedure we have not used airway blocks yes local we have given in a few cases where the airway is really compromised but uh, never have uh, done under airway blocks must be with the difference of uh, interventional uh, so, uh, uh, physicians we are dealing with our uh, interventional physicians are comfortable going through the nose so any airway we put they will want us to remove at the time of stenting so for, for us uh, prefer the eye gel they find it very comfortable with the eye gel eye gel our, our uh, uh, physicians want to go only through the nose so for us uh, any artificial airway cannot remain there at the time of dilatation or at the time of stenting okay so that's a i mean i don't know uh, this is our our experience okay
how do you manage uh, fluids i mean this is open to uh, all the speakers uh, what, what are the uh, guidelines that you follow how, how do you prevent uh, post operative uh, pulmonary edema because that that never came up i think the only uh, point where we have to restrict our fluids in chest trauma is with patients who have lung contusions I mean, those are the patients where I would be telling my residents, "Let's go slow on the fluids. Let's go." Obviously, uh, like the guidelines do say, in lung resection surgeries and pneumonectomies, you uh, judicious don't use too much of fluids. Try to maintain an output of 0.5 ml per kg per hour. That's what our surgeons always, when you're doing a pneumonectomy, keep the patient dry, keep the patient dry. But uh, I have personally feel there's a flip side to it also. Too much of dehydrating the patient also sometimes becomes detrimental if i have a arterial line in place i do look at the trends of the lactate because you may not be doing your uh, uh, this minimal invasive cardiac output monitoring all the time look at your arterial tracing also is it showing too much of hypovolemia while restricting too much of fluids is your lactate rising a bit because these because what happens if you too much you are restricting too much of fluids the patient ends up in tachycardia his lactate starts building up and that also starts a vicious cycle again so what personally i believe is you have to balance it how your patient is going intraoperatively if by restricting fluids you are maintaining urine output there's not too much of tachycardia or lactate is within range Okay, you can go out of restriction. But if any time your lactate is going out of hand, your tachycardia is increasing, your arterial trace is too much of hypovolemia, then you have to uh, give in some fluids. You cannot just completely, you know, uh, just go by the surgeon, keep him dry, keep him dry. So that's how I go about it. You have to, you know, case by case basis, you have to determine how the patient is behaving in trauma. Fact, trauma guidelines tell you that you need. to give fluid to the patients when they come before we start actually finding out what is the reason for his uh, you know uh, the injury so initial fluid resuscitation is a must and arterial waveform in the ed is not possible in the ot yes it's possible and that's a very good uh, um, way of monitoring our pulse pressure variation and that's how we are managing our fluids in the ot just by looking at the arterial waveforms yeah Yeah, and but, the uh, obviously, both of you are uh, talking about different substrates. Thoracic trauma needs to be handled differently yes. than a patient who is undergoing uh, lung resection. Yeah, but the lung, as you said, lung resection mm. and lung injuries, the fluids need to go down. That's true. Yeah, that's that is, yeah, yeah. Another question here from the audience: What is the cutoff values of a pH and blood gas values for thoracic surgery, especially endobronchial? uh in endobronchials uh endobronchial suite we usually do not put in an a line so the, uh, we cannot really comment on the ph values uh for the lung resection surgeries yes we put in a line and i think nitin will then answer that uh you uh, if we are talking about the preoperative evaluation of the patient uh uh like uh, i think the uh, it was a ph for ph like obviously uh uh like uh, i don't think i've encountered patient coming for lung resection with a very high uh, co2 and internalist patient is coming for uh, bullet mees and he requires a, a bull, uh, bullet mee or a lung volume reduction surgery or is in respiratory failure then maybe the co2 uh, will be on the higher side but uh, uh, there's no definitive cut off value that we want yeah. to give up this until let the ph is too low you know yeah. then then that patient will be on some sort of a ventilatory support so obviously that becomes a contraindication but if the patient is you know he is uh, taking care of himself preoperatively he is uh, you know if he is well enough to walk into the or and he is been maintaining that way for for the past few months able to maintain himself not on any require any ventilator or bipap support then you can take up the patient i don't think i ever we ever uh, i think uh, we should conclude now and stop okay. the questions Yeah, I think we have exceeded time. I agree. Uh, Sanish, is, is it okay? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, absolutely. I think we've had a very nice discussion. Of course, the lectures were excellent, and uh, the students can, of course, always ask us questions later as well. Uh, Manjula, have we covered everything in the chat box? Because there were some questions. I hope we've covered all of them. 
Yeah, we have covered all, yeah. madam. I have oh, checked. Oh. Uh, I have checked right. the chat box. So, right. Okay. So, um, I think we'll ask Dr. Baljeet to conclude, and uh, of course, we've all enjoyed it very much, and they were very, very uh, educative and uh, practical points that all three of them, Urvi, Shikha, Nitin, have been highly appreciated. Thanks a lot. Uh, Madam, Balji. can I say something here? Of course. Yeah, I thank uh, Anesthesia TV and Mr. Rahul Chaube also, who has uh, really done the wonderful job for us today. And he has um, agreed to do it uh, for the future also for uh, our webinia. So I thank uh, Rahul Chaube. Thank you very much. Yes. And Madam, now you can ask Dr. Valjeet to conclude. Yes, yes, yes. We would all like to thank them, the Anesthesia well, TV. Yes. Uh, Baljeet, are you there? Uh, yeah, I'm there. Certainly, I'm there. Yes. Yes. Very good evening. And uh, all good things must come to an end. First of all, I compliment all the speakers. There are a lot of new information which uh, Dr. Nitin Sethi had uh, uh, given, and uh, of course, uh, Dr. Shekha as well. And some amazing management of uh, very challenging cases by Dr. Urvi and uh, her team in that hospital. I think there's a lot of learning, uh, you know, particularly for the youngsters here with this webinar. And uh, uh, of course, the, it was very well moderated by Dr. Sunil. And, uh, you know, there was, uh, the, what, what pleased me the most was the way uh, the speakers had handled the question answer session and uh, how they justified uh, what they are doing and, uh, you know, how all, uh, whatever challenges they come across uh, during surgery or they, they come across before that. Great uh, discussion and uh, thank all the participants also who asked questions and uh, of course the speakers who, uh, you know, handle these uh, discussions. Well, till we meet again uh, next week for another exciting webinar on Wednesday on the Velvet Heart Disease. Friends, uh, on behalf of Indian College of Anesthesiologists, the president, the CEO, Sam, the dean, and everybody here, uh, you know, from Indian College of Anesthesiologists, I thank everyone, the participants, yes, uh, of course, uh, the speakers for their wonderful talks, and Dr. Sunil also for, uh, you know, coordinating and, and moderating the discussion. Thank you so much, uh, you know, very good night, and uh, you, we meet again next week. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you Dr. Baljeet, and thank, thank you, everybody. You. Thank, thank you, you. Good, good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.